So how's everybody doing after lunch? Excited to be at an in-person DrupalCon? Yeah, right? Talking to people, remember? You kind of forget, like, you're like, by, I don't know about anybody else, you're like, Tuesday, you were like, my throat feels a little weird, it's not anything bad, it just, oh right, I've been talking to people for two days straight, like, all right, getting used to that again. Uh, thank you all for coming. Before we dive in, I'd like to start with a little background on this talk. It was first given uh, as a keynote at Drupal GovCon in 2021. Myself and my co-hosts of the Talking Drupal podcast uh, originally presented this as a show. The three of us plan to adopt this uh, into a presentation for DrupalCon uh, and present it. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic and important life events, Nick and Steven couldn't join us here today. However, they both contributed greatly to this talk, and I'd like to take a minute to thank Nick Laughlin and Stephen Cross for what I hope will be a great presentation. I also hope that as we go, uh, you'll see not only their non-code contributions, but the contributions of many folks, both within and outside the Drupal community. I'd like to welcome you to non-code contribution using your passion and skills to power open source. So a little bit about me. My name is John Picozzi. I'm a solutions architect at EPAM. I'm a co-organizer of the New England Drupal Camp, an organizer of the Drupal Providence Meetup, and if you didn't confer, uh, get from my previous statement, co-host on the Talking Drupal podcast. Throughout this talk, we're going to use each of these uh, my non-code contributions to highlight the importance of non-code contrib and hopefully uh, give you all ideas on how you can contribute to not only the Drupal community, but open source in general. So today we're talking about non-code contribution. And we're going to start with a, a question. What is non-code contribution? Well, like any good person in our industry, I went to Google and I, I asked Google, what is non-code contribution? And dug a little bit, but it said, any contribution that helps an open source project that does not involve writing code. I kind of said, well, thanks, Google. I kind of figured that out. You know, it's really about providing your time, your skills, or resources to benefit the project. So we're going to continue on talking about non-code contribution. And you know, I'm going to use that term a lot today. Um, you know, and the reason why is early on, contribution was considered writing code. I think even Dries said it on Monday in a panel that originally, you know, Drupal's motto was built by developers for developers, right? Over the years, the Drupal community has, has shifted from that. Over time, we've learned that non-code contribution is just as important as code contribution. It's interesting. When we first were talking about this and came up with this idea, Nick Laughlin had said, rather than defining non-code contribution by what it is not, not code, uh, we need a term that defines what it is. And we talked about it for like half an hour and decided we were, we were not going to be able to come to a reasonable conclusion to be able to rebrand non-code contribution. But at its heart, at its core, contribution is contribution, whether it's code contribution or non-code contribution. So, Let's talk a little bit about where open source is built. It's built in meetups, camps, cons, by the community, right? Matter of fact, if you think about it, a majority of contribution has very little to do with coding at those events. So, in order to have those events, we need to think about all of the other stuff, right? And events, don't get me wrong, events have 
contribution sprints. There are people writing code. But if we think of events as a whole, people attending are contributing. Speakers are contributing. Training, in this picture here, in the blue right there, you'll see Leslie Glynn, who runs a lot of trainings at camps. Organizing the events, the events don't just happen out of the blue, right? Mike Miles right there in the, uh, in the shirt up front is the organizer of the Boston meetup, and this is a picture from, from that meetup. Everyone in this room, yes, you, are contributing to the Drupal project right now. You are a contributor. By sharing your ideas, asking questions, you're helping to improve the project. So let's dive into camp organization a little bit because there's a ton of non-code contribution that happens at camps. Number of opportunities to get involved. So this is a uh, picture uh, of the New England Drupal Camp organizing team. Uh, and all of these folks work with Drupal in one way or another. Either they build it or they sell it. Um, but when it comes to a Drupal camp, they don't necessarily have to work with Drupal or, or work on the code of, of a, a camp website, right? So Stephen Cross, he works with sponsorship, and he was the lead of the camp for many years. Nick Laughlin does actually work with Drupal because he, he builds our website, but he also handles signage for the camp and making sure people know where they're going. Myself, I'm currently leading the camp and working on day of logistics and, and working with our vendors and our venue to make sure that we can have a camp. Rick Hood's working on sending emails. DJ's working on social media. Leslie's working on volunteering and training. Mike's doing session submissions and selection. At the end of the day, there are so many volunteer opportunities for non-code contribution at camps that it's a great starting point. There are plenty of other examples of non-code contribution out there, and this list is not exhaustive. We could go on for hours about all of the possible ways. Mentorship, um, I'm sure all of you know Amy June. Amy June's driving mentorship here at DrupalCon, and, and that's super important. Documentation, again, training, we've already talked about that. Summits. Being on a committee or board, myself, I'm on the event organizers working group. Even answering questions in the issue queue or in Slack, none of this involves writing code, but they're still super important to the community. So who is a contributor? Is it a self-designation? I'm a contributor. Is it a community designation? You're a contributor. Hopefully we can, we can shed some light on that. Surprise, everyone is a contributor. Everyone has something to contribute to open source. So let's think of a couple of those scenarios, right? A designer can create UI for a module. Um, they can create a module logo, right? Uh, marketing folks. Modules need help marketing. Camps need help marketing, right? You know, even your accountant could be a contributor. Drupal events have budgets, and those budgets need people that are good with numbers to manage them. I was in a talk just this morning about Modic, and Ruth was saying that they have five different, different uh, groups of contributors, and She's the only one in the legal and accounting section. So that's an area where somebody can help. It doesn't necessarily involve writing code, but it helps the project. And you don't have to wait for somebody to say, hey, you're a contributor. You can get involved and tell people, I'm a contributor. So let's dive into why do people contribute. Um, you could ask everybody in this room. 
that question, right? And everybody would give you a different answer. Um, there may be some common responses, but I think you, you'd get a wide variety of answers. Uh, I like to think of contribution uh, as a relationship, you know? It could be a give and take relationship. Um, and some people just do it because it makes them feel good. Let's dive into some other reasons. So contributing helps to build skills, right? You have the ability to improve technical understanding, better communication, or you could learn something new. Let's dive into those a little bit uh, in detail and, and I can give you some, um, some maybe some examples. So a project manager, maybe for their job, they're learning a new technology, they need a better understanding, a better technical understanding. They can get that through non-code contrib. An account manager that needs to understand a little bit better, you know, uh, complex workflows. Let's take it from the other side. What about a back-end developer that wants to improve their project management skills? Or a front-end developer that wants to learn some new event planning skills? If you have skills you want to improve, you can bring that skill to an open source project to build it. Career improvement, visibility, building personal networks, networking at events. Let's dive into those. Visibility. I'm pretty visible up here talking to all you fine folks, right? Um, one thing that I look at when hiring somebody is their Drupal.org profile. Contribution to the community is important to me. I want to know how people are contributing when I'm interviewing them. The D.O profile is a great way to do that. Um, even now, they recently added uh, contribution roles to Drupal.org. So you can go to a Drupal.org profile and understand how somebody is contributing, both project-wise, code-wise, and non-code-wise. Building your personal network. Everyone, look at the person next to you. You guys are building your personal network right now. Good job. And then networking at events. I mean, there are 1,100-ish uh, people here at DrupalCon. If you get to know every single one of them, that's awesome. You know, I think every job that I've gotten, right, has been from a personal connection or somebody in my network. Open source is about making connections. So this one might be a little less popular, but compensation is a part of contribution. Financial contra uh, compensation, time, and sometimes goods and services you know, can be, can be comp types of compensation. So financial compensation, some people get paid to contribute. There are, I, I get paid to contribute. I know people from um, other companies get paid to contribute. Um, contribution isn't always free. Um, it also doesn't have to be nights and weekends. You don't have to say like, oh, I love to contribute, but I, I need to do it, you know, on my nights and weekends. Every job that I've had during the interview process, I've asked about open source contribution. What are the policies? What's, what's the approach? Because it's important to me. Time. Some people may not get paid to contribute, but their company has something where they can get extra time off if they contribute to open source or other perks. And then there's always goods and services. Maybe it's outside of your job. You contribute to a project, project sends you a free t-shirt, or they give you um, a month free of their service. The bottom line here is compensation isn't a bad thing. It's not wrong to get something in return for contributing. So we talked a little bit about in the previous slide it being part of your job. We're going to dive into that a little bit deeper here, right? Contribution as part of your job is good for your employee, uh, good for the employee as well as the employer. 
Um, the government has been contributing for a very long time. And you know what? If it's not part of your job, maybe you should start the dialogue. Let's dig into those a little bit. So employers are openly supporting open source. We're all here. We've been on the expo floor. There are a lot of companies supporting open source. And they're finding that it's in benefiting both the company as well as their employees. Some companies even go as far as to write it into their contracts with their clients that, hey, we're working on open source. We're going to contribute to the community. In talking Drupal 315, we actually learned from the WordPress community that WordPress launched in 2014 the Five for the Future campaign, which encourages organizations to contribute 5% of their resources to WordPress development. That's awesome. If we turn this and look at the government, the federal government in 2016 had the federal source code policy. And that basically supported open source and encouraged agencies to share uh, information as well as, as well as their code. 20% of created uh, code has to be open source and publicly available. That could be one reason why Drupal is so popular in government. At the end of the day, if contribution to open source isn't part of your job and you'd like it to be, have a conversation with your employer. Figure out how you can work it into your day to day. Why do we contribute? So you might be thinking, hey, John, you just talked about this. Well, this is going to be a more personal look at open source. So when we did this show for Drupal GovCon, we asked each host this question. And um, Stephen responded by saying that he loves sharing and learning. Um, I piggybacked on that by saying, like, I love education and you know knowledge sharing with people. Um, I also like helping people solve uh, really tricky technical problems. At its core, I like helping people. Uh, I also felt like I liked supporting something larger than myself. You know, I want to make the world a better place, and I want to do that through open source software. So for this talk, I took it a little wider, and I asked this question to uh, a couple of Slack channels that I'm part of to get more of a, a community response. So if we look at this, Kevin Thull said that he uses Drupal to make a living and wanted to give back. So he started, the recording, uh, he started recording sessions and volunteering at camps. Matthew Saunders said he was willing to help. He's like, I only made four code contributions. But anytime you ask Matthew to do something, he's always there, willing to help and happy to do it. Martin wanted to pay it forward. Nick Laughlin said that the, gift, the community gave him so much he wanted to give back. Leslie likes to help people learn. And Sarabi said that it helped her to advance her career, to volunteer. Let's talk about something else, another non-code contribution, the Talking Drupal podcast. For those of you who don't know, Talking Drupal is a weekly chat about web design development by a group of people with one thing in common. We love Drupal. And in the beginning, Stephen Cross first got the idea for Talking Drupal back in 2013, after experimenting with podcasting um, with his daughter. They had a, a smaller podcast about another subject for, I think they did five episodes or so. Stephen pitched the idea to a few friends from the Drupal community. Um, and I like to think from that point on, the rest is podcast history. Um, you'll see here, this is actually a, a screenshot of our, our first podcast recording um, back in, uh, yeah, 2013. So what did we learn from this? We learned how the mechanics of podcasting. Um, the work involved with pre- and post-production. And guess what? 
none of this really has anything to do with building Drupal websites. It was a passion. We wanted to share information. And we like to learn. We sim had similar Drupal journeys. And we thought it might make an interesting podcast. The other great thing was we just got to talk about Drupal every week. So that, that was a plus. We're still learning today. We're still taking those learnings and improving the show. This is actually from a couple of weeks ago. You'll see Amy June and Mike Anello there. Um, we're talking about mentoring right here at DrupalCon. You can see it's a it's a vast it's vastly different from our from our first show. Today we bring on other Drupal contributors to spread the word about projects they're working on, and we feel like it's really giving back to the community. Now, question might be coming up. Well, when did you guys start considering talking Drupal as a as a non code contribution? Well, truth be told, um, we didn't. We didn't start Drupal as a non-code contribution. As I just said, we, we simply were a bunch of tech guys that wanted to talk about Drupal. Um, so how did it come to be a non-code contribution? Well, we actually realized one day that it had always been a non-code contribution. We just didn't consider it that way at first because the community was very code-focused. So in November of 2020, uh, we decided to create a community project and go back and give everyone that had ever been, at that point, seven years of, of talking Drupal on the show, credit for their contribution. And when we did this, we were a little bit worried. We were like, somebody's going to yell at us. We're going to get a letter from Dries. He's not going to be happy about this. But then the exact opposite happened. People started getting credit, and they started reaching out going, this is great. This is awesome. Like, great job. Thank you for doing this. It was amazing. So I just talked about community projects. And um, some of you may be wondering what that is. So don't worry. I have a slide for that. When you go to Drupal.org and you go to create a new module page, project page, there is an option for a community project. And it says, a community project is a non-code project used to manage a group or initiative within the Drupal community, such as a Drupal camp or working group. You should use this if you want a project page and an issue queue, but do not have code that needs to be packaged, right? This page is being used for camps, groups, and actually recently at EPAM, we created a community page, community project for all of the um, community work that we're doing within EPAM. We have internal contribution days, so we're giving our employees credit for those, for those days. So you might be asking, why is this important? Well, here's just some of the community projects that you can find on, on Drupal.org. The Drupal Coffee Exchange, the Drupal Swag Shop, the Camp Recording Initiative that I talked about with Kevin, Drupal Camp Asheville, Drupal GovCon, Discover Drupal, we've all heard about that, right? All of which don't have a lot to do with the code, but they're driving the community forward. So why are non-code contributions important? You know what? As valuable to the health of the project as code contributions are, non-code contributions are just as valuable. There are non-code requirements for all projects. And not everyone is a developer or a coder, right? It gets more people with a variety of skills involved in the community. Everyone has something to offer. Everyone has a skill to bring to the community. 
different points of view are brought in by different people. A marketing person can have different experiences and perspectives than a developer. Overall, it helps move open source forward. That's why non-code contribution is important. So you may be sitting here and like, uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling you, non-code contribution is important, but there are still challenges. I mean, contribution in general has challenges, right? So contribution imposter syndrome, this is actually something that I feel like I suffer from. Thinking like, hey, my contribution isn't going to be valuable. Um, you know, maybe my, my, maybe you know, I shouldn't do this because it's not going to be helpful to anybody. You can combat that by focusing on your skills and your passions. Um, I personally know enough code to be dangerous. I'm perfectly willing to admit that. Um, so I focused on event organizing and sharing information. Work-life balance. We all struggle with that, right? We have jobs. We have uh, contributions that we want to make. We have, we have families. Contribution should be enjoyable. Uh, it shouldn't be another job. Work it into your work. We already talked about this. Build a career based on contribution. Again, contribution doesn't have to be nights and weekends. Something I like to do is my work day, I, I sandwich it between two 30-minute blocks of contribution time. You also, if you do have to work on it on a night or a weekend, tackle one thing a night. There are many, many weeks that I'll say, okay, Monday is going to be talking Drupal night, and Tuesday is going to be, um, you know, New England Drupal camp night, and, and Friday might be, might be Drupal Providence night. Again, if you can, provide contrib during your workday. It doesn't take any time at all to reply to an issue on a, in, in the issue queue or a Slack comment, right? Build it into your work. So if you've ever talked to Jacob Rockowitz about module sustainability, he's, he's a wealth of, of knowledge. You know, it's easy to get excited about a project when you're first starting out, you're first getting into it, you're like, oh, I'm excited about this. Energy is high, you know, it's new. Sometimes that, that dwindles after, over time, right? And that's okay. As projects go on, your interests may change. That's all right. Just be honest with yourself. You have to see value in contribution and want to contribute. So hopefully at this point you're like, okay, I'm ready to go. What do I do? Put me in, coach. How do you get involved? Well, just do it. Ask in the issue queue or in Slack as a starting point. Read documentation. Update the documentation if you find a problem. You can also reach out to most camp organizers for recommendations. We're pretty friendly people. We'll, we'll give you some ideas. There's a whole community out there waiting to support you. Remember, stick to your skills, your interests. You have something to contribute. You have skills. You have interests. Use them. Also, could, contribution doesn't have to be related to your job. You know, it, you could decide to contribute to something that you know very little about or that you want to know more about. It could be, as I said, a new skill, something you want to improve upon. At the end of the day, just talk to people. Again, we're here, 11, roughly 1,100 people, right? Just start a conversation. Again, comment in the issue queue, ask a question, go to a camp or a meetup. So as I get ready to wrap this up, I'd like to share a quote with you from Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens 
can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Dr. Mead doesn't say a small group of code writers or developers. She says a thoughtful, committed group of citizens. Citizens with great passion and many different skills. That's what powers open source. That's what powers Drupal. Here's a QR code to some helpful resources, um, some things I've mentioned throughout my talk. Um, if you have questions, I'll be more than happy to take them now. And uh, after this, I will be at the EPAM booth. Um, happy to answer more questions there. And uh, if you haven't gotten a pair of our socks yet, feel free to stop on by. We have a couple left. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Question in the back. Um, are there sort of like, I don't know, topical areas that you use in the practice? Like, for example, most of my work is with um, environmental nonprofits working on sustainability issues and how they use the internet and web to further sustainability programs, things like that. Like, one thing that I'm always sort of craving is there's got to be other people in the world who are trying to find innovative ways to use things like Drupal to solve those kinds of problems. Is there, are there spaces like that where a bunch of, you know, in my case, it's environmentalist tech groups can get together and just talk? That's a great question. Uh, so the question is, are there um, topic-specific meetups uh, for, for things like um, environmental uh, issues, right? So, so uh, you know, I think nothing comes to mind, but I, I think the best place to kind of get that conversation started is, um, is in Slack. You know, jump into Drupal Slack, see if anybody is out there um, that has has the same you know the same uh, passion, and you know maybe even take it as far as if there are a couple of people in your kind of geographic area, or or maybe not even they don't don't even have to be now with with Zoom, right? You know, if there are a couple of people, maybe you start a, a meetup that's specific to that topic. Um, you know, I think that's that's a that's a great idea. Okay. Would you say, Chris, uh, one more time? Um, I feel like I've seen reference on Slack to a Drupal sustainability uh, um, initiative or group that's actually already out there. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I think Drupal Slack is your first is your first go to there, right? Because it'll it'll allow for uh, for more eyes on the on that on that question and and kind of get you uh, get you to people that be able to help you out. Nicole, what can I do for you? Somebody wants to be on Talking Drupal. What should they do? Oh, man, that's a great question. So um, you can uh, reach out to me, and um, that's, that's what I do. I schedule people to come talk on Talking Drupal. So. Where can we find Talking Drupal? Okay, I'm not answering that question. <laughs> nice try, though. All right, if anybody else has any, oh, wait. I knew it. Go ahead. So you have mentioned a couple of, of interesting angles for me. And I am a developer at a social media company. And so if I, I would really want to contribute. I'd really want to encourage it. And all my coworkers want to contribute. But sometimes you know, they can just use it to make value in their privacy. And so there have been a couple of really great times to keep that up and try to you know, um, find different ways to find value. But are there any really So that's a great question, and I'll re repeat it one more time for the recording. Um, organizational support for for contribution, um, whether non-code or, or code contribution. Yeah. So 
I don't have any resources off the top of my head other than other community members. And, um, you know, that's something where uh, I've struggled with that myself in the past. Like, hey, we need to be more involved. We need to do more things. And, you know, the big, the big why. Like, why do we need to do that? It's not bringing in any money. Matter of fact, it's probably costing us money, right? And um, at the end of the day, uh, it comes down to, um, you know, being a good citizen of open source, right? Everybody gets Drupal for free. Everybody can go to Drupal.org, download it, install it, build a website with it at no cost to them, right? Agencies do that, and you know, they should they should give back. So you know, I would say try to um, try to try to hammer on that that idea that as a as an agency using using an open source piece of software, it's important to give back, and as as a good community member, it's important to give back. Um, that's a lot of why people are here. That's a lot of why the companies are here that you see here, right? Because they want to give back to open source. They believe in open source. Um, you know, I, I think there are, are plenty of people doing great things with Drupal and, and other open source projects. And, you know, I, I think it's worth having, you know, having a conversation with your leadership to say like, hey, we want to be more involved. Like, how do we, how do we do that? I'm going to go to you and then Nate. That's actually an awesome point, and I actually just had a conversation with somebody yesterday that that said that same exact thing. Like, oh, we have an RFP that we want to send out, but we want to we want to send it out to community contributors. We want to send it out to people that are that are giving back to the Drupal community. So, I mean, that's that's one way you can bring it back to like the the financial growth and the the business growth is like, hey. You know, people are out there and they are looking for Drupal practitioners and, and community supporters to work on these projects. Go ahead, Nate. That's exactly what I was going to say. Which is that if whenever you're struggling trying to get support, trying to shift your perspective from what they're going to get out of it, and if a CEO is looking from a financial gain perspective, say, yeah. hey, if we can make more contributions, we can list that as selling point for our company, yeah. uh, we're going to get more bids, like you were just saying, um, and framing it from that perspective when asking for support. Yeah, that's if you take an, an exact example, say the Georgia 2016, right. it's a multi-million dollar RFP. Minimum requirements were if you can't show up at the Drupal community, don't waste your time with the Drupal site. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what's great is like you are setting the stage for that. It's like as a key level person to be like, hey, where is value? Hey, listen. It starts. It starts with you. I've talked to I've talked to many CEOs throughout my career and been like, "Listen, we need to we need to do this." And they're the same thing. Why? Absolutely. Just like curiosity, do you guys do other work than Drupal work, or is it just Drupal work? Okay. Sure. And more efficient. I mean, you can. They would get a better response when they reach out to us. I mean, there, there are probably a couple of people at this conference that would love to talk to them. <laughs> Nate, did I? I answered your question, right? Yeah, sure. Um, you, I think it was pretty awesome of you to touch on like imposter syndrome. As somebody that's been in the Drupal community for a long time, I have not made a lot of code or non-code contributions directly back to it. I'm trying to improve that. Part of that being because I wasn't a developer full time over the years. Yeah. Um, so, like getting started, I, I, you're right. You should just step in. But like when you're dealing with 
trying to get started, and imposter syndrome, and everything else that's going on. Do you have any tips on like where to start? One thing I obviously do is read through the book from Ludwig, so I'm going to get involved there. Um, I don't know. Is there anything you speak to on that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's kind of like double double edged, right? So if you're just getting started and you're feeling feeling the imposter syndrome, start small. You know, start answering a question in, in the issue queue. Start by, um, you know, maybe maybe delivering a talk at a meet a meetup or something like that. Start start small and and build up. Um, you know, as I said in my talk, like I know enough code to be dangerous. Other Nate can uh, can back me up on that. That I'm not much of a coder, um, but. Yeah, but I'm, you know, I'm a solutions architect. I'm a, a fairly decent site builder. Um, so, like, there are other skills that I have that I can I can share with people. That's the other thing, like, knowledge transfer. Showing people things like, hey, I did this wrong like six times, but then I did it right, and here's how I did it right. Like, that's a great contribution and something that is literally could be one on one, right? So I think you have to start small, and you have to know that your contribution, just showing up, is valuable. Because without everybody showing up, without everybody flying to Portland, or jumping on Slack, or getting into the issue queue, community doesn't work. The community withers and dies. And that's not good for any of us. You'll be fine. All right, well, again, I appreciate everybody's time. If any other questions, hit me up on Twitter.